we all want to do something of value, right? To like find some passion, some project. I think we're all looking for some meaning. I have this information that can like help people live better lives and just be happier and not as angry and not as frustrated, right? And like, if they could just make a couple little changes in their life. And like, I've made the choice that, you know, this is important. This is, this is worth doing. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a brand new listener or a longtime listener, it's always an honor to have you back for another episode. The title of today's episode is The Secret Superpower of FI, and that stands for Financial Independence, of course. This is a conversation with Brad Barrett. He's the co-host of the popular Choose FI podcast. And Brad's been a friend of mine for a long time, and we have a conversation, not about real estate specifically, about financial independence. And the topic of his show, they get in all sorts of things related to financial independence, but we talk about these tools and these skills that you're building around owning your money and mastering your money and mastering the process of investing and saving and getting your mindset right around money as a superpower. Now, what does a superpower help you accomplish? Well, it can help you accomplish anything you want within reason, right, in terms of a lifestyle. And we talk about our own stories. I, I dug into some questions I didn't know about Brad, about how he got started and, and journeyed from choosing a place to live and some simple decisions like that. He moved, lived to, in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the story of him leaving his job as a CPA, what were the things that allowed him to do that? But then also we get into entrepreneurship. One of the topics that's near and dear to my heart, you know, real estate investing has been a business that I created a long time ago, but I also love this idea of starting entrepreneurship, whether it's just a small side hustle that makes it a little bit of money every month or something that could turn into a full-time gig. And we talk about each of our own entrepreneurial journeys, but the common theme here is a discussion around this superpower that all of you I know are building and why it's important, how it can help you to build an ideal lifestyle that allows you to do the things that matter to you. So that's what this conversation is about. I hope you find it helpful. Now, before we get to the interview, it's time for my weekly behind the scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what I'm thinking or what's going on with me behind the scenes in my real estate investing business or personal financial life. And the topic I want to talk to you about, I've actually been rereading a book called Your Money or Your Life. It's probably one of my favorite top three money books of all time. If you haven't read that, check it out. But this, this conversation with Brad actually stimulated an idea for me of the difference between being cheap, you know, the whole character of somebody who just doesn't spend money on anything and miser who is just a penny pincher and never enjoys life, always sacrifices enjoyment now in order to save money for someday in the future. Now, that's one idea and comparing that to this idea of being frugal or as Brad put it in our conversation today, you will hear being a valuist somebody who spends money very freely on things that are, they value, that are important to you, and but not spending on things that aren't important to you. And so I was thinking about the, how this is kind of manifested in my own life. Uh, and this is very personal. That's why they call it personal finance. But for example, my wife and I have spent over the years a lot of money on travel. We've, take, we've taken many retirements. We went to South America. We went to Europe. Um, that costs money to travel, to to pay for hotel rooms, to pay for things back at home while you're gone. Uh, we spent a lot of money on experiences, things that are, we can remember and do with our family. We're going to a concert with our kids pretty soon here. We went to a, an Avid Brothers concert earlier this year. We're going to an Imagine Dragons concert, which is one of my daughter's favorite bands. So we're going to be listening to them. So no problem dropping money on that. For us personally, spending money on cars is just not an enjoyment. I know some people love cars, and that's the thing they do want to spend money on. We don't spend a lot of money on that. And even our personal residence, we have chosen to live in a nice home. We have nothing to complain about, but it could be a lot more. We could, we could fix it up even more. We could do even more with it. But this idea that I got from your money in your life just reminded me was uh, the author, Vicki Robin, said that being frugal means we have a high joy to stuff ratio. I just found that so beautiful to think about. It's not about being cheap and putting joy off until the end of your life. Actually, it's the opposite. I, fi I have found that people I know in the financial independence movement, people who value saving money for more freedom, for more flexibility, they actually are very joyful in what their life looks like, right? Even right now, even while they're saving money. 
And so that's the idea I wanted to share with you is something that has been a really kind of a foundational piece for my wife and I just as we first read that book back in 2000 three or four, I think it was very early in our relationship. And we started thinking about what matters to us, what it was, what, you know, what kinds of things do we value, but it has been a joyful journey as well. You don't have to skimp and deprive yourself. In fact, you shouldn't, it's a long journey. And, and so I just it was thinking about those expenditures ourselves and even now, and maybe you could do the same kind of exercise, just do a brainstorm with you. And if you have a spouse who's on board on this journey with you, think about what do you value? What's important to you? What brings you joy? And how can we spend money on that? Like even maybe more money on that, but then spend less money on the things that don't matter to you. And that can be a very legitimate and actually joyful and practical way to save money, to enjoy the ride, and then still get to where you're trying to go financially. Hey, Brad, welcome to the podcast. Hey, John, thanks for having me here. This should be fun. Yeah, this has been a long time coming for me. I've had this like on my list probably two years now <laughs> to say I've got to have I got to have Brad on the podcast. I have really enjoyed being on the Choose FI podcast and I want to talk about I want to get into Choose FI and the, the movement and the, the community that you and Jonathan have built and just a lot of talk about that. But I thought just for people in our in my audience who, who have not heard your backstory, I'd love to kind of start back closer to the beginning professionally okay. and, and business wise. Like, so tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your, your career path before you got into the fire community and to the choose FI, what, what was your career and where are you from? And let's talk yeah. about that a little bit. No, that sounds good. The whole, the whole backstory. So yeah, yeah I grew up in uh, long Island, New York. So high cost of living area, about 45 minutes outside of New York city. Uh, I went to college. I was a CPA. So I got my first job as this uh, dates me here, but I got my first job in 2001. Okay. And I was working at what the time was the best accounting firm in the entire world, which was Arthur Anderson. And within nine months of starting, the company no longer existed because of the Enron scandal back then for people who, who remember that historical event at this point. But yep. I mean, it was the wildest thing. I've ever gone through. I mean, again, to join this massive accounting firm with this incredible reputation and to see it implode was, was a lesson on, on so many levels, you know, obviously just impossible to imagine that this could have happened, but just like on an impermanence, you know, and you think about the partners who they thought they had it made, right? I mean, they were partners at Arthur Anderson and because of the, I guess, bad judgment and whatever malfeasance of, of one little office in Dallas, the company imploded. And, you know, you think about like those, those initial thoughts of Phi. And I think I actually, for as short a time as I was there, I really learned a lot of this can't be my path, right? Like you're always beholden to somebody, right? I think about all, again, those partners or the senior managers who they had great incomes, but they were spending a hundred percent of it, right? And they were in a dire scenario when this happened. Or I thought about like, okay, we, you know, we grew up, we had our summers off, we had winter breaks, and then you get into the quote unquote real world. And goodness, you're lucky to take a week off if you're lucky, right? I mean, it, it's crazy. So that's that's nine calendar days, right? You 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 have the five five work week four work days the two weekends, you get nine calendar days, if you're lucky. And that was what I was signing up for, for 40 years, unless I found some exit strategy, right? So like, again, it was all these, these tiny little lessons. So that's a long way of saying it got me, it got me realizing like I could not do this and I needed another path. And, you know, luckily I was a natural saver. So I wish I could say like, I almost wish I had a better story, Chad, that like <laughs> I, I read some book and it, it was this epiphany and it changed everything, but I was a natural saver. I lived at home for the first couple of years and I saved 90% of my income. And I was actually able to purchase a piece of real estate. So it, Long Island, uh, uh, these apartments, they were co-ops. So I uh, bought a co-op apartment, lived there for a couple of years and wound up then selling it when I got married and was able to, I think it was like a $50,000 profit, which was like the greatest thing that big ever money. happened. That's big money at that point. Right, that's yeah. huge money, right? For a 23, 24 <laughs> yeah. year old kid, like that's yeah. massive money. So uh, yeah, I mean, those were really like the very first steps. 
And then, like I said, got married. And my wife and I, this was like that pivotal moment. We basically said, we said to ourselves, we're like, look, we're both CPAs. We make a decent income. We're going to make a better income. We can obviously, quote unquote, afford to live on Long Island. We, we could do it. But we knew we'd always have to give something up or many somethings, right? Like you think about the different pillars, right? Like saving, regular saving, saving for retirement, travel, just living a normal life, having kids and potentially wanting one, one parent to stay home. Like we knew we couldn't do all of that there. And that wasn't, that again, wasn't a life we wanted to sign up for. So I don't know how we had the the wherewithal or presence of mind at 25, 26 to think that way, but, but thankfully we did. And we went up moving to Richmond, Virginia, which is dramatically lower cost of living. And that just, that was the bump that we needed to, to really get us on this path to find. You know, I've never heard that story, Brad, but what I find so interesting, like I'm thinking about my own story and I found this just talking to different people that sometimes there's an epiphany moment and there's just this, I read this book or I listened to this podcast episode. You know, we love those calls, right? When people call in and say that, but there's also what I'm hearing from you, which I, I resonate with was that I, I got started just with this like kind of vague, like sense of I wanted independence and autonomy and like every decision I would run into, I just kind of bump into decisions. I was 23 and I just got finished playing football in college. And I was just like so sick of meetings. Like they, we'd have these huge meetings, with like 110 people in football. And there it was a little bit like the military. They're kind of managing your life. And I was just like, get me out of this like straight jacket. You know, like I just got to have some flexibility and some freedom. And so the idea of going for me going, I was going to go to medical school. And the idea of going back to medical school, which I thought was interesting and really wanted to do was so confining. And so like, it was just like the, 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 it was almost like a compass. Like, it's just like, Hey, all right, this decision has a little bit more freedom than that decision. And it sounds like for you, like, you know, Long Island would be great. There's a lifestyle that I like, I grew up there, but there's just this, all right, I just kind of got this like inkling in my, in my kind of impulse that I want a little bit more flexibility, a little more freedom. I, and, and, and so and you grow from there and that sometimes that's enough. Like it doesn't have to be this like epiphany moment, I guess. Yeah. I hear you. And, and I love that, that kind of like gut feeling. Like that's something that I, I really trust. It's funny. Like I, I think of myself as an analytical person, but like I, I truly believe in like there's gut feelings, there's energy to certain decisions or relationships. And like, and I, I trust that more and more. And I think this was this case of, of just unease, right? That like there has to be a better option. There has to be a better way. And thankfully, again, this predated predated me finding Mr. Money Mustache or, or any aspect of the financial independence movement. But I mean, thankfully, we we realized saving money was a way, right? Like as simple as that, like, it's like reframing so many people. And, and this is the language that I have today, Chad, obviously, I didn't have this language at 25. But like, so many people think about saving money as deprivation, right? Like, it's akin to a diet, it's, it's a short term thing. It's something I'm only doing just to get a better budget or when, you know, you always hear these, like these, these phrasings that just, they don't resonate with me because again, it sounds like deprivation in the sense of like, I know most diets don't work. They don't work not because the actual quote unquote diet doesn't work necessarily. You know, we could talk about that separately, right? <laughs> but like, but it's the mindset, right? It's the mindset of short termism. It's the mindset of, oh, I just have to hold myself back from doing that. And I think it's so similar with money, right? Like when you think about it as, okay, I'm going to do this for a short term to accomplish some goal or pay off my credit card. And then I can go back to my free spending ways, you know, like that doesn't work. It has to be, it has to be a lifestyle. It has to be for something. Right. Right. And like for us that for something was, Hey, we want to have kids someday and we want one of the parents to stay home. And like, that was the guiding light for us. And that made it really, really easy to save money and not buy a new car or go out to fancy dinners all the time, even though we could quote unquote afford it. So like having that why I think is really important, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the ideas that I've taken, you know, from the Choose FI 
uh, kind of tome of ideas that you and Jonathan have put put out there and that you wrote about that you and Chris wrote about in the book is this idea of being a valuist like what you were just talking about reminded me of that because I also kind of when people talk budgets or they talk about saving money just on the surface like that's not enough but y'all talk talk to me a little bit about the idea of being a valuist because what you just said I want to have kids I want to have flexibility I want one one of the spouses to be able to stay home like those are have nothing to do with money. Those are values, but and yet money is like intricately attached to those. So yeah. what is it? How do, how do you, how do you differentiate between a valuist and somebody who's like cheap or frugal? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And, and I definitely want to give credit where credit's due with the valuist term. One of the members of our community wrote in with that, like in, I think in 2017 as a physician named Bo actually in our, in our community, just really great guy. And like, and that term resonated with me, right? Like, because it's not about being cheap, right? Like that is what I hate so much about the caricature of the financial independence community is like, we're all about those like, you know, brown bananas. Do you remember that from like the Wall Street Journal article yeah. or whatever, like, you know, and and just trying to like scrimp and save with like pennies at a time. And I don't know about you, well, I do know about you, like that sounds like a terrible life, right? I mean, you and I, we don't live like that. I don't think anybody who's truly successful at life or on the path to fly like lives like that because you just you can't sustain that. Why would you want to sustain that? Like we, if we're lucky, we get what eight or nine decades on this planet, right? And to waste it, depriving yourself about a couple of pennies over brown bananas or reusing I don't know aluminum foil. Oh, that, that's insane, right? So, so <laughs> like for me, the value is like make purchasing decisions with intentionality and based on what I truly value in my life, not what someone else values, not what the neighbor next door values, not what society values. Okay. And I think that provides some freedom in the sense that like, there's no, like we always like to say, there's no card carrying member of the financial independence community. You don't have to check boxes because it's truly personal. Like I, don't like spending money on cars. Like that is not my thing. I get no, no marginal value from like an expensive car over my little Honda Civic. I get none, but there are people who do, who genuinely enjoy that. And I say like more power to you, right? But like, if you're doing it from that place of intentionality, of value, what do I value? I value spending for this person $700 a month on a BMW. Like, okay, that's fine but you have to make choices in life, right? Like you have to a make choices from you're not doing this because you're sleepwalking, right? You're not doing this because the neighbor bought a BMW. So you're making that choice from intentionality, but B the choice is there are limited resources, right? Like unless you make many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and then five or $700 a month in a car, it doesn't mean anything. But for most of us, that's not a practical reality, right? So if you make even a nice salary, right? Like you make a hundred thousand, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars as a couple, or thereabouts. Like when you start adding in seven hundred dollar a month expenses on top of your living, on top of everything, like the money's going to go pretty quickly, right? So, are you willing to make that choice from a place of value? Of okay, I value this, but then I don't value that because you know, Chad. Obviously, you see people all the time, right? Like we we both see like people say they value things. And when you keep spending the money goes quick, right? And then yeah. if you have a 0% savings rate, I don't care if you make 120 K a year, you're, you're not, I mean, I hate to use this term, but you're poor if yeah. you're saving zero or negative, right? Like it doesn't matter what the income is. It matters what the savings rate is and the net worth. Yeah. I, I love the value frame for those reasons you just said, and it, it gives you, if, if you look at just ignoring money for a moment, like you're always, the cliche is that, you know, you can tell what somebody's values are just by what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Like you don't, you don't ask somebody to, to, what kind of character do they have by, based on what they say or what they wrote on a blog post. You're like, you look at what they did and for better or worse, like money, I don't think any of us who talk about money all the time think money is the most important thing, but it is one form of measurement of your life's energy. Like that whole money, your money, your life idea, you know, yeah. like this is your life energy. Like where you put your money is where you're prioritizing your life. 
And, and so I, I think it's such a valuable tool in that way. And that's why I love this. You know, I, I love measuring it and thinking about it, not because that's so important, but because value is important because of the things we value. So that's one reason I really like the fire movements at its best has put forward this idea of asking what's important to me, like doing what matters. I've tried to put that idea out a lot on my, my podcast, like what matters to you? Like that's a conversation worth having when people are feeling frustrated and disillusioned and you know, they're not wanting to work and they're quitting their jobs. Like something is bothering people a lot about having not being aligned with their values. Like there's something wrong there and money's not going to solve that by itself, but it's, it's certainly getting in the way of that. Wouldn't, I mean, have you yeah. found that to be the case with the people you're talking to out there? Yeah. Well, I mean, first that like that money as like the overarching principle, right? Like I think a lot, I think a lot of people assume, and I, I'm sure you get this, like that we think about money all the time. Like, you know, we're financial podcasters or whatever you want to call it. Like we think about money all the time. And like, for me, I put my money on autopilot. Like it was important to do, to do the work. It's like, like front load the sacrifice, you know, like you do the hard things, you put the plans in place to get your money. So you get to a point where you don't have to think about your money all the time. Right. And then you think about like all the stress that people get from being in financial difficulty, which is significant. And like, let's not lose sight of that for one second. Like, I mean, there are tens upon tens of millions of people in the US alone who, I mean, if they have any type of little emergency or hiccup, like that could be a catastrophe. Right. So that's why, well, it's important to not lose sight of that. I think that's that gives further credibility to why we're doing what we're doing, right? Is we're trying to explain to people that like, it's so important to save, you know, it's so important to have even just a small emergency fund because then that stress goes down so dramatically, right? Like, can you imagine, right? Like at this point in your life, your family's life, like if a $300, I don't know, broken fridge or something was like a calamity, I mean, you think about the stress of that, right? So like, that's why we don't focus on money anymore, but because we focused on it so intently, it's enabled us to then take that step back and say, okay, what do we actually want to do with our lives? Right. And I think that's kind of where your question was leading. I, I think I, I probably forgot the exact uh, tone of it, but no, that's a like, right. Like it, it's, it's really important to know, like, again, like, I hate to, to say this in a negative sense, but like we get eight or nine decades on this planet. Like, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to, like for me, when I was 22 staring at that accounting job, like, and I saw again, you know, my partner there at 2 AM with us stapling tax returns to be mailed out. Like that was success, right? Like <laughs> that, how insane was that? That was the partner making half a million or a million dollars a year. Like, that was what I had to look forward to. Like, that's not something to look forward to. That's yeah. horrible. Like, yeah. regardless of the money, regardless of the scoreboard. So therefore there has to be something better, right? There has to be a different way. And yeah, I mean, like, you know, Chad, I, I think this would be like kind of a cool thing for you and I to talk about, cause we're like, we're at this point where I think we're both trying to like design, what does our life look like? What does our life with family look like? Right? Like, you know, I don't mean to hijack your show. Do it. No, go like, for it. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's like that, that's a super cool conversation because it's, it's not, it's not easy and it constantly changes. Like, I think that's an important like mental framework for just like how I look at life is like, sure. There are principles and what is it like strong convictions loosely held is, is a phrase like, you know, I have principles, but I'm constantly trying to learn mm. and I'm constantly updating my thinking because life changes information changes. Like, you know, I believe strongly in index fund investing, but I'm willing to admit that I could change my mind at some point. Like if I just said, no, that's my religion for the next 70 years. Like, I think I'd be pretty stupid. Like I'd be right. disappointed in myself, you know? Yep. So information's always changing, but I think, I think that's good, but that's kind of overwhelming for some people too, you know? Right. Yeah. There's a, there's a responsibility of having to make a lot of decisions where it's, it's a little easier to say, this is the index fund religion and let's just go with it. You know, never, never change my mind for. Right. And that's what everybody else is doing, right? Like yeah. everybody else is going, doing the nine to five forever and spending all their money. And like, yeah, 
and like I think there's there's ease to that there's comfort to that but like I don't know I I like I don't know my wife always says like I'm I'm like the biggest like questioner that <laughs> that exists like I just I just like thinking through things and you know if there's a better path like I think phi is kind of like it, it's almost like this like secret to life you know it, it's like how can you live the same middle or upper middle class life as anybody else but just make a couple little tweaks and instead of living paycheck to paycheck you're saving 20 30 50 percent of your income like isn't that cool like don't i don't know yeah. like i i think that's the neatest thing in the world i, I somebody called that the superpower of phi didn't they didn't, did i hear somebody say that i think i don't know I, I agree 100 percent. and i mean it's I want to go back to, to your story to kind of demonstrate what I think part of that point is, is like you, you had the CPA profession, you saw the partner stapling the, the tax returns at 2 a.m. Like, God, that is, that, I just, I, I can picture that, that desk and that exact thing happening. Cause I think I've been there myself, but um, for you, like you, you've been discussing ur like the sense of urgency. So we only have 80 years on earth. I, th I think that's one of the, the, the concept of time, I think is one of the things that gets all of us kind of off the bench and into the game more than anything. Like if there's anything that can motivate us to like change our life is the realization that this thing's short, like we might not be here. If nothing else, even if we lived 80 years of life and you're 30 years old, you're, if you have kids or something, the kids are going to be grown up. 10 years from now, they're going to be gone. So do you, do you remember a moment for yourself when you're already saving money, where you're just like, things are, you know, you're kind of building wealth, but you, you said, I need to shift something and do something different. W was it starting Choose FI? Was it leaving the CPA job when you kind of made a pretty big life decision, but it was as a result of that urgency of saying like, I can't wait any longer. Like this, this thing has to happen. Yeah, that, that is a damn good question. So yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have a very clear one, but like my, my kind of first response to that would be reading the four hour work week from Tim Ferriss was like that aha moment for me that like, once I read that, I knew I wasn't going to stay a CPA for the rest of my career. I didn't know how, I didn't know why, I didn't know what I was going to do, but that was just like, it planted that seed, right? That, that germination. And it's like, oh man, there's something more. And there's something that like, I can figure this out. And like that again, it's like, it's like that kind of questioner, but it's also that fun aspect, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, how do you live this life and win, right? Like that. And, and I, I'm not like a uber competitive person anymore, but like that's, it, it felt like just this fun game. Yep. And so, so yeah, like I, you know, kind of fast forward, I read that book. I wound up one of my buddies from back home had like a drop shipping site where he like sold uh printer ink cartridges and like this was way back when like you know in the in the 2000s so you know pre very very early on internet and like i kind of convinced him to help me like start some internet business and like you know in all honesty it, it never went anywhere it was like i learned a lot of lessons we we could talk for like an hour on entrepreneurship separately but uh Needless to say, that didn't go anywhere, but it, it gave me some skills. And I think that again is part of this journey, right? Like it's asking questions, but it's picking up skills along the way and like, and figuring out, like we call it like the talent stack. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like, how do you put all these little life skills together that you aren't and don't have to be world-class at? Like there are very few people who are in the top 10th of a percent at anything. But the cool thing is, you don't actually have to be like, if you can put together like a, a totally disparate set of skills that maybe the world has never seen before, but you're only like in the top 20%, like sometimes that's good enough. And that's yeah. actually kind of what I did. So I started, and this was, I think when we very first met, uh, you know, back in the day at FinCon, I was gonna, yes. I was gonna wear the, the old school <laughs> FinCon t-shirt just to, uh, since I know you love to rock that as well as I, I do. I, I thought you might be wearing it. So I was like, yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not sure this would work, you know, <laughs> no, not, that was definitely, I was definitely in that stage as well. So, so the four hour work week, and then you started, you started the drop sh shipping business. I remember that yeah. it was, was it Richmond Sabres after that? Or was that, was that still the time when you were, was that before? Yes. Yeah. yeah good, good call it. Yeah. So it was right. Drop shipping and then some like really kind of skeezy site like a uh, black hat seo just really bad stuff like it's hard to imagine that like the brad of today would ever be like that insincere and do that stuff but again that's for another podcast another time but yeah it started richmond savers and it was just like 
okay, this is something I'm actually passionate about mm -hmm. and personal finance, just generally personal finance. And what I wound up doing was I wound up getting into uh, travel rewards. So credit card rewards points. And, you know, this is where like that intersection of, of passion and skills and knowledge and that talent stack comes in, in that like, I wound up, so I realized, okay, my little website, richmondsavers.com is like never going to change the world. That was kind of like, it might be a limiting belief, but that was, that was the realization that I had, but that didn't mean it couldn't be a success. And I think this was like probably the most important pivot, pivotal moment of my whole career, honestly, is okay. What can I do differently? If I can take this, sure. I'm only getting whatever it was, a couple thousand visitors. I don't, I don't remember, Chad, you know, a month or what, what the exact number was, but yeah. you know, it was pretty small, right? But how can I make that a business? Well, I can put my accountant's hat on and say, all right, again, talent stack. There aren't that many CPAs who are also travel rewards experts who have personal finance websites and have affiliate relationships with credit cards. Like they're just, they're probably one of those people, right? And yeah. like, yep. you know, I realized again, knowing the limitation of I'm not getting millions of visitors, what could I do? So I actually started a, I called it a free travel rewards coaching program. All right. So no joke at lunchtime at my CPA job. So I'm like a tax manager for a big company at noon and 1230. <laughs> I had calls lined up. I had 30 minute calls lined up essentially every single day. So like 10 calls a week. And I would give people, I would hop on the phone in real life with people who just came to my website. And it was like, okay, I'm offering this service for free, but again, putting my accountant's hat on, looking at lifetime value of customer, I said, oh, interesting. If I can help these people and I can devise a travel rewards plan for them to go to Disney or Paris or Hawaii or wherever it may be, and they happen to open up a credit card and click through the links on my website, I can make money today potentially from them opening that first card, but hopefully for the next year or two, if they keep going back to that email that this random guy, Brad from Richmond Savers sent them two years ago. Right? So it was like, okay, not everybody's going to do that, but everybody doesn't have to do it. Again, it's like lifetime value of customer. It's thinking through from a business perspective of, okay, I'm offering the service for free and then I can potentially have revenue for a couple of years from it, you know, and it, it was a test. And, you know, I wish I could say I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars from that, but like, again, the, the visitors were pretty small, but that was the point where I was like, oh, I could probably scale this, yep. you know? And that was, okay, let me start travel miles 101. So it was like one of these steps led to another, you know, and that, that was something that was able to be scaled. Yeah, that's, that's so much fun. Like I, I, entrepreneurial or origin stories to me are just so cool. You know, I, I think, you know, I'm, I've done a lot in the real estate space, of course, that first deal, that first, you know, offer, but also in the online business space for me, you know, like I, this coach Carson thing was totally accidental for me in terms of, like, I didn't picture having a blog, a podcast, writing a book. It was like very similar to yours. Like it was like, I was at a local club teaching. Somebody said, can you come talk about the marketing you did to find properties? Cause I, I was, I was, four or five years into the business, you know, 26 years old and having a little bit of success. And then from there, it kind of got to be where somebody wanted to take you to lunch and ask about this. And I was like, well, this is like eventually going to get not sustainable. So what if I just do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one consulting? And that's how, that's how businesses are started. Like that's just, just somebody needs something. You have some value, some talent stack that you just talked about, some weird, odd configuration of <laughs> talents that you have. And, and I love that because it's, it's about owning your, you got to own your unique talent stack, but then you've also the challenge for you in, in your case and in all of our cases is to then find a match in the marketplace that, that makes sense. And we might, if you're a normal entrepreneur, you might go through 10 different tests to, to, to find a match that actually works. Like that first one might not work, but that's that little tinkering that you just did. That you just explained there. That's, that's the origin of almost any business in the whole world. Like that's it. Yeah. yeah and the cool thing, like, like you did, you kind of proved this out before you ever thought of it as a business. Right. Right. It was the same with me. Like I didn't, I wasn't going to put tens of thousands of dollars into my business and come up with a business plan and do all this. Like you don't have to do that stuff anymore. Like that's what's, what's so beautiful and exciting about this is like you can test small and you can fail small. 
right? Like mm-hmm. ideally you hit a home run with your first business, but like, like you just said, like that doesn't happen very frequently, but if you reframe those like quote unquote failures as, Hey, I learned something, right? Like I picked up these skills and maybe I learned what not to do. You know, I kind of alluded in passing to that, like those kind of gray or black hat SEO sites that I, that I built, they were like these ridiculous content farms. And like, again, I, I'm mortified saying it out loud that like I did that, but the people that I was learning from online at that point and whatever it was 2007, that was what tens of thousands of people were doing and they were making money until they weren't right until Google smacked them down with an algorithm change and like to their great credit and my site shouldn't have existed thereafter. But you know, I learned tons of lessons from that. Like, do I regret doing them? No, I absolutely don't. Like I didn't waste that much money. I wasted time, but it's kind of good that I'm mortified after the fact, because I learned like I never wanted to be insincere ever again with a business. And that helped guide me forward. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think this is what's cool. Like a lot of people might see somebody like, like me and you and, and say like, Oh, their success is an online business. They can never relate or like, Oh, they, their overnight success or they hit a home run or whatever. Like I failed more times than I could count. Like I, if you wanted to hear the list of websites that I've, you know, firewood-rack.net, soccertools.com, the house reference.com. Like, I mean, ridiculous stuff. Like I have a laundry list of these things, yep. you know? And like it, it's, again, it started with something, the success started with something small, like richmondsavers.com, which sounds like a coupon site for like Richmond, Virginia. Like who the hell could be successful from that? But I, I you know, like I had a thought of like, Hey, maybe someone locally would find me somebody on the news. And that actually came to fruition. Like the yeah. local NBC affiliate, literally their money person Googled saving money, Richmond, Virginia, and lo and behold, who does, who shows up right. richmondsavers.com. Like, and you know, it, it's funny how these little things happen and you know, you asked for like that epiphany moment. And, and like I was kind of alluding to with travel miles one one like it, it still is hard to take, to take that jump and leave your safe job. Like anybody who says it's not hard, I think is either lying to themselves or lying to you, you know, because I was well along the path to FI. I had proven out this business model could be something successful, but I was still trying to figure out like, how do I leave this safe job? How do I leave this job that is paying me a decent salary and is right down the road He's only nine to five. I don't have to work overtime. Like, how do I leave that? And, you know, again, I, I found something that I, I b- truly believed I could scale, but there was also that like aha moment of, it sounds so silly to say out loud, but like my, the VP of my department, all of a sudden decided one day, like we needed to come in instead of at eight 30, we needed to come in at eight every That's morning like, for, for nothing, right. just for no reason. And it was like the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, like that excuse I was looking for. It just like, it enraged me so much that like, <laughs> I'm going to give two and a half hours of my life every single week for nothing. Like right. when I was doing all my work, you know, supposedly the highest reviewed person in our department, like, I'm just going to donate two and a half hours of my life to you. Like, no. So I'm done. that was actually it. <laughs> What did you say? Say, I'm done. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, out. I'm yeah. done. I'm out. And I mean, literally like within a week. I made that decision and mm. yeah, haven't looked back. Love it. Yeah. So the four hour work week was my book as well. Uh, the, the, your money, your life was, I think kind of took me from the, you know, let's build a million dollars and build this huge wealth building business to like, no, wait a minute. I want to, I want to like have financial independence, but then the four hour work week for very similar to you was like, okay, like here's a mechanics, here's a, here's a lifestyle. Like I remember the idea of like the new rich where time is the ma- main currency instead of money. And that just like hit me like a, like a lightning bolt. And there, there's something else too, though, that, that the through line of that book, which I see in your, your kind of trajectory also in mine and, and very, very much in a lot of people who are in the fire movement, I noticed this parallel path of building wealth with like the core investments. So whether it's index funds, stocks, equities, real estate, whatever the case might be kind of traditional wealth building investments, 
but then stacking onto that, something that y'all talk a lot about at Choose FI is this uh, entrepreneurship, this business, this something that builds income. And it's, it's too much of a commonality to, to ignore. Like this is a really common thing. And I, and I, I want to just have us talk a little bit about it from our own perspective. Like, so for me, you know, I, I could live off just my rental income. Like it, it pays the bills and has a cushion. And so there, there's no problem there. And yet I still do this Coach Carson business, which started off as a hobby, a passion, but I've made the choice and I've been a, I've been a little bit ambivalent about it. So I want to get your take on this for a long time, for two or three years, I was like, yeah, this is just a hobby. Like I, I'm not going to make any money from this. Like, why would I do make money? But then I, then I started getting bills and I had to e- you know, email so- uh, software started costing yeah. money. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm losing money on my hobby. And so then all of a sudden the entrepreneur in me kicked back in and I'm like, okay, like let's make this a business. And also I can use this money to contribute and to, and so like I've had a kind of a flip with my post fire lifestyle, but the, I guess the idea I started with this though, was that, you know, the, the, the core portfolio plus having a business, whether it's like us, like just kind of a lifestyle business and this just have fun with it also makes some money or somebody else who says, this is my path to actually leaving my job because the, you know, I'm not that confident in the 4% rule or I just want to have a little bit extra money this could be a huge, like having a business is like such a critical piece. I guess there's a lot of different ways you could go with that question or that topic, but what what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think like you said, there's enough of a commonality that it's, it, it's hard to ignore. Right. And, and I think, I mean, I could talk about my own perspective and I will, but I think a lot of it is that like fun problem solving for a lot of people. Like, because again, like the caricature of the fire movement is retire early and sit on the beach and do nothing. And, and I just, I just so wholly reject that. Like, I don't, I don't know of anybody in the whole community that I've ever heard just sitting there doing nothing. I mean, with their brown bananas, with their brown bananas <laughs> yeah, the, and their reused aluminum foil. <laughs> right. I mean, like we all want, to prov- I don't know. I, I don't even know how to phrase it, but like to do something of value, right? To like find some passion, some project that could mean, I don't know, volunteering. It, it doesn't have to be money making. Like, but I think, I think we're all looking for some meaning. And I, I think that's kind of like where, where I come down on this is like, and I, and I suspect you do as well. Like with, like, I know you think of yourself as, as a coach or a teacher, I do on some level as well. Like I feel like I I have this information that can like help people live better lives and just be happier and not as angry and not as frustrated. Right. And like, if they could just make a couple little changes in their life and like, sure, it would be easier and more selfish for me to just sit here and read all day or hang out with my family and play board games. Like, that would be really, really easy. And I mean, honestly, Chad, like it's funny that I, br- I actually brought up books first because like my biggest passion in life is, or my biggest hobby is reading. And I think I read Here like too. four books. Yeah, nice. Same way. I, I have read four books. I think I read four books last year. Like that is pitiful. Like in my perfect world, I would read five hours a day. Mm-hmm. But I've made the choice that, you know, this is important. This is this is worth doing, this choose up I thing, right? And when you get, you talked about those emails you get when, you know, I get emails that, Hey, your podcast helped change my life. That's hard to ignore. Like that feels really, really good that you're making some kind of positive impact on the world. And I think, I think that's what a lot of us want to do. Like I said, it doesn't have to be grandiose. It can be volunteering locally. It can be tutoring someone. It could just be being a better parent, right? Like having more time to be present. Like, we want to somehow do something positive for the world. And I think a lot of us wind up finding ways to make businesses around them, not with necessarily profit as the motive, though, I mean, that helps too. I mean, you'd, you'd be a fool to say it doesn't help, but, or that you would turn it down, right? I think that's, mm-hmm. that's probably the better way to phrase it. But uh, I mean, it, it does feel good to do something good for the world. And yeah, I guess that's that's kind of where I would come down on on the entrepreneurship. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've been, for a long time, I've been interested in this idea of social businesses. And I'm not yeah. sure if you've heard it. There's an author named Mohammed Yunus who won a Nobel Peace oh, Prize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he started a, a Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And the back, kind of backstory of that was he started this business as a professor, just like looking at a problem and saying, all right, there's a lot of people hungry. There's a big famine in this country. And he, a lot of people are poor. And so he tried to kind of go, what's the root cause of a lot of this? And one of the root causes was they just didn't have any money. None of the banks would loan money to him. So he started this whole social business. The whole purpose was to help solve poverty, but it was a business structure as opposed to a, cha- a complete, you know, a charity structure. And there's nothing wrong with charities too. Like there's, re- there's kind of places for all this, but I've been really intrigued. And this is all related to the business idea, by the way, is that can you use business structures to add value and help solve social problems? And uh, for people who want to read about this, there's tons of books on that. Muhammad Yunus is a great one. But I've, I've been kind of pl- playing around with this post-fi idea of because I've been so good at starting businesses and growing a business, like for me to put that on the shelf, was a, I did that for a little bit. You know, I traveled to Ecuador and I was making like no revenue from, you know, this online business and it was all real estate. But I, I kind of felt like there was this, you know, as you call it, like the superpower, this, this, this gift that you're given that was sitting on the shelf. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, like... I don't need the money, but yet, but this is like an opportunity that could be used. And so the thing that kind of got me out of the ambivalent zone, and this is still a struggle a little bit, but was, well, what could I do with more money in a way that could have a positive impact in the, in the world around me? And there's some very practical things. Like we, we started a, a charity here in uh, Clemson, which was a, called the Green Crescent Trail, Friends of the Green Crescent. And we're trying to connect all of our community with biking and walking trails. And it's an advocacy group. It's a nonprofit. But that needs money. You know, like th- this effort, this effort that, to do this stuff and to advocate doesn't, you know, you have to have revenue to do that. And so it started kind of coming to me like, why would these people who are post-fi, who are good at making money and who enjoy making money, if you can, if you can kind of join those two things, I'm not saying that everybody needs to make money, but if you happen to find a passion project like we have that also has the potential to make revenue, it could be a social business to the point where the profits, either a portion of the profits, maybe all the profits could then go towards these things that are important to you. And it's just, it's kind of become a, a post-fi hobby for me. So we're, my wife and I have started a foundation, kind of one of the, I think Leaf from Position on Fire kind of helped us think about what, how to start that. But we started a charitable trust. And so we're donating, you know, right at this point, 50% of the profits from anything I do with Coach Carson into that, which reminded me a lot of the, you know, the Choose FI Foundation. I know you guys do a lot of that too. So I don't know, I'm, just, I'm putting the idea out there of you know, entrepreneurship, but also this idea of social businesses, because I think what Choose FI is doing is a social business as I, as I define and think about it. It's, it's got a mission, it's got a, um, you know, a cause, which is people kind of getting out of this financial grind and getting out of this, and you have education that helps people. So I don't know, have you thought about it that way? Have you thought about what you're doing as a, as a mission? Huh. That's, that's really interesting. Well, first, I appreciate it, obviously. And, and second, well, maybe more importantly, that's amazing what you're doing. I didn't realize, I did not realize you're doing that. That's remarkable. Uh, I mean, goodness is, yeah, well, I mean, to your question, I don't think I've ever like intellectually internalized it, that it's like, you know, the social good, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think clearly, you know, especially again with like the feedback you get, it's like you realize that you're not just talking into a microphone or you're not just putting out content to nobody. Like, I think for me, one of the things that that we hit on so early was, was really talk about people taking action. And I think like, that's what changes people's lives is like, as we always say, like get up off the couch and take action and do just something little to make your life better. Right? Like, it's so easy to passively take in content and do nothing, right? Like do absolutely nothing with them. Like, and, and console yourself like, Oh, but, but I'm learning so much and I'm getting all this good information. But if you're not doing anything with it, like what's kind of, what's the point, right? Like, so I think like if there's one social aspect that, that we've really done exceedingly well with, it's like somehow, and I don't know what kind of weird alchemy it is, but like somehow we're able to compel people to take action on their own behalf to make their lives better. And like, that feels really cool. You know, like it, it feels fantastic that something about these two idiots from Richmond, Virginia, talking (laughs) to a microphone, like to themselves somehow makes the world better. Like, 
man, that's really, really awesome. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, mean, I have, you know, the, this would be a fun discussion, but I have opinions. I think part of it is the, the way y'all built it from my outside looking in was from the beginning, it was a community driven yeah. movement, which I, I find fascinating. I'd love to hear more about how that idea came to be, but you know, there's, there's sometimes there's a podcast or somebody starts it and the idea is I'm going to sit on this pedestal and talk out to everybody and hear these great ideas I have. Whereas I I think both of you are very knowledgeable, obviously, but you had enough humility to say, Hey, this is a crowdsourced show. We want to learn from you. We want to have ideas. That's that resonates with people. I think that's the the ideas were obviously there, but uh, I love, I love the community aspect of what y'all have built and how you want to bring other people along. And I'm wondering when you first started that, was that a, how much of a deliberate choice was that to see that that could be the secret sauce, the, the community yeah. itself? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we definitely hit very early on that like this could not be limited by my knowledge or Jonathan's knowledge. And yeah, I mean, we, I kind of joke about two idiots from Richmond, but like, you know, we know our stuff We're you know, we're reasonably intelligent guys, but like, but it could never, it could never be us as gurus. It could never be, oh, this is what I know, and I'm going to pontificate this from on high. Like nobody wants to listen to that. People want to feel a part of something. Hmm. You know, they want to be part of a group. And I think us calling it the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show, you know, a little uh, self-aggrandizing, obviously. <laughs> but 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 the ultimate part wasn't the important part. It was the crowdsource. It was, hey, we can all, if we all band together, it could be a rising tide lifts all boats scenario, right? Like Mm -hmm. where you, Chad, undoubtedly have 20 or 50 or 100 life hacks that you do, little things you do. Life hacks is kind of a weird phrase, but little things you do in your life that you just take for granted that you don't even think about because they're so obvious to you, but that could almost undoubtedly help every single other member of the financial independence community. Right. Like I have these little things like everybody has these little things. And how do we somehow share that? Like that, that was my dream. And, you know, in all honesty, like that's a really hard dream to come to fruition. Like, and, you know, we haven't, we, we, we've probably gotten one tenth of 1% of that, that ideal goal, but it's not the end inside. It's, Hey, this is the concept, right? So what that means is you as a member of the community, you're part of the show, right? Like Mm -hmm. when you write us an email with some cool thing that you found, or you send in a voicemail, we play it because it's not about us. It's not about me and Jonathan at all. It's about the community. It's about us all living better lives. And we were very, very clear. Yeah. From the outset that like, this is what the deal is. Like we need, we didn't, we don't just want your involvement. We need your involvement because you're just as important as we are to this. We're just mouthpieces for this. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was, it was a, a little bit of, of good fortune, but there was intentionality obviously behind it that, that this is critical. Like it, if we all band together, we all live better lives. Well, I remember those early days. So like, what, what are we five, five years, yeah, six years, five, I guess. Yeah. No, five I mean, years and a little bit of change. Un- unbelievable. Crazy. But you know, yeah. um, and I, I appreciate the fact that y'all, I forget which, I think it was 17 episode, episode yeah, 17, but it, right. it was early, early on. I remember, like, I remember you emailing me saying, all right, we got this show going. Uh-huh. We're going to, we're going to line up a bunch of guests. I'm going to have, of course, we're going to have like, you know, Jeb and some other people on there. And you're, we, we want to have you on the show, Chad. I'm like, oh, really? Wow. That's amazing. Thank you. And, uh, but I thought it would be successful. Like, I'm like, this is a great idea, but looking forward and we're looking back now and seeing where the show has gone blows my mind. I mean, you guys have really in the community has just come a long way. And I don't know what's, you know, stats to look at it, but just to show, you know, in the podcasting world, y'all are in the top 25 business investing podcasts, which is just an amazing accomplishment. You're consistently, when I look at the Apple podcasts, you know, the business um, entrepreneurship section or career section, y'all are always in the top five. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, that's what, a what a journey five, six years later to, I know. Did, did, could you imagine that this was where it would be at that point? No, I mean, no, it's still, it would, thank you. It's weird. Like even just hearing that out loud, like it, it, you know, and that's not like false humility. It's just, it, again, like we're just two guys in Richmond, Virginia talking into microphones and like, but yet it's resonated because of, of this action of this community, of all this stuff. Like 
but yeah, I mean, obviously I, I like, I'd be completely lying to you if I saw like, we're going to be one of the biggest podcasts in the world. Like that, it was inconceivable, you know, but Jonathan, cool- Jonathan, might, Jonathan might have predicted it. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan may have predicted it. Very <laughs> but, but like the neatest thing is that like, it was never like that lightning in a bottle. It was never, oh, we were on Good Morning America and we got 200,000 downloads and we held on to a little bit of that. You know, it, it was none of that. Nothing. It was like, it was just organic growth. And it always has been like, and that's why like, if somebody asked me like, how do I grow a podcast? Like, I, I don't have like a really great answer, but I think that is the great answer. It's like, mm. what you do is you create really good content that people want to share. Right. And in the case of financial independence, it was, okay, we think this is like the superpower to life, but it's pretty hard to share this with your friends, right? Because it seemed really inaccessible. And, you know, obviously Pete, Mr. Money Mustache is, is, is a good friend of mine. Like he, he inspired me and still does to this day. So there's zero percent offense to him, but like he obviously, he has this, this persona online. That's like, you know, the, the badassery and the punch you in the face and all that, right? Yeah. Like, and, and it, I mean, it's so wonderful. And like, he has clearly changed the world in ways like that, that we could only aspire to, but like, but we realize also there has to be a way to normalize this. And I think that was another kind of intentional pivot that we made is like, Hey, how could you share this with a friend? Right? Like, how could you make talking about personal finance, which is one of those great taboos, like sadly in, in society, like it's a taboo to talk about money, but I, I'd like to think that we've made it a little bit easier to talk about money. Um, and I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. So yeah, I mean, I guess like, oh, sorry, Chad, I think you wanted to jump in. No, no, no. That's, that's exactly where I wanted to go. And I just, I wanted to celebrate that first and foremost, just because I'm proud of what you guys have done. And I'm proud to be, you know, in this association of other people who are contributors and fans. And, and I just think it's amazing. And I think there's a vocabulary what, what, beyond the community, which I think was the first thing that really jumped out of mind. What y'all have done is, is really assemble a vocabulary from this crowdsourced community of the, the words and the terms and the, uh, the journey, the steps of the journey and the levers of fire, you know, the, the, all, all of these things, which, you know, Dave Ramsey's done that with the get out of debt thing. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a language that the community has. And, and so I think that's a contribution y'all have made that Pete has made as well. With Mr. Money Mustache. There's a, there's a, you know, the mustachians have their own kind of flavor of, you know, bicycling and living in a community. And those people resonate with that. And you got, you have normalized and kind of broadened, I think that, that idea to your credit and just think it's, it's awesome. What's, what's, what you guys have done and what the community has done. And, uh, I guess a follow-up question to that would be like, what, uh, you know, you five years out, like, do you, do you have any other ideas that what could be different or what could be next yeah. for choose FI? Like what's, uh, what's next? Yeah, that is a, uh, that's a damn good question. John. I, I, I don't really know at this point. I wish I had some, some grand answer. I, I think, you know, we're really enjoying, really enjoying the podcast still, you know, it, it's, it's obviously there's always a balance right with with your regular life as we talked about before and producing content and i mean my kids are getting older and i want to spend time with them while they're still in the house so like there's a constant balance and again anybody who tells you otherwise like oh life is easy when you're fine like it's easier right but like there's always a balance and like that's i i find that exciting you know like and there are different seasons of life as our friend jillian johns really likes to say mm-hmm. you know and like for me now I think if you had asked me a couple of years ago, I would have thought, okay, maybe we could take on the world and become the biggest personal finance, you know, website or, or media empire. Like, I just want to help people at the end of the day. Like, I don't have grand aspirations. Like, I, I just really want to help people. And like, and I think we're trying to do that. Like, you know, where we still, we're publishing books through our Choose of I Media and, we have uh, our friend Brian Feraldi has a book coming out in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, excuse me, uh, which is super exciting. Our foundation, as you mentioned before, we have a, a free five one hundred one course and a K through twelve pre K through twelve curriculum, and you know we're just trying to we're just trying to spread this message. You know, again, there's no lighting in a bottle, like it, or I haven't found it, but like <laughs> what I what I just really want is 
people just to continue feeling comfortable talking about this with their friends. And, you know, how can we help them? How can we provide tools that if they do feel comfortable talking with their friends, that they can send their friends somewhere, you know? So like you talked about that lexicon that we have. And like, I feel like obviously we have 500 plus episodes of the podcast, but have we done the greatest job in the world of, of curating that on our website for somebody who wants to find specific information about real estate? You know, like we have the episodes with you and Paula Pants and whoever, or like we're entrepreneurship and, you know, the Roth IRA conversion, like all these things, like all the information's there. But if you say, hey, go listen to sort through 550 podcast episodes, yeah, probably not going to work all that well, right? Yeah. So I think like for me at this point, it's more like, how do I curate a path to make something easy for people. And so, you know, again, it's not this grand aspiration, but it's, it's like that fundamental piece that's just really important to just genuinely continue helping people. Hmm. Yeah. I really resonate with that as well. I've, I've had some struggle and this is like a first world luxury struggle. Right. But like of, of identifying for me, like, what is the, what, what am I, what's my objective with this, podcast. What, what am I doing here? Like sometimes I just, uh, with, with real estate and with financial independence, it was much easier for me because it was easier to quantify and say, okay, when I get to this num five number or when I have this amount of income, like that's a very specific grand goal to make. And it's pretty easy to measure. I find it ex like you, I find it exciting, but also a little disorienting at times where it's like, okay, well, my orientation is I want to be helpful. I think that's the perfect frame for me as well. But what does that look like? I, I also don't have any like grandiose plans. Like I, I think there's probably media people out there who have, the, you know, we want to have this many, you know, downloads and this many, like, I, I'm kind of looking at that as like, that's the outcome that'll come from how helpful yeah. this podcast yeah. is. And, and also just how much, you know, that intersection of like enjoyment, having a passion for something with being helpful and with what you're good at. That kind of, I think Jim Collins called that the hed hedgehog concept is if, if to me, post fi if you can continually find that little intersection of those three things, your passion, your helpfulness, and what you're good at, your skills, like what a great place to be in. Like how, how lucky, how lucky are we to be able to talk about the things we're passionate about, to be able to connect with you, Brad, and, and hang out and chat, and then also have, however many people are listening to this say, you know what, this is a helpful conversation. I can use some of this, these tools and go improve my life. And we can have a larger community of people who have all are doing better and who are happier and who are uh, giving back in their own way. I just think that's, it's hard for me to get my head around that idea, but it's, it's satisfying in a very unquantifiable, but nice way. Yeah. Oh man. It's hard, hard to uh, top that other than just say here, here. I mean, my goodness, <laughs> there's uh, nothing else to say. I totally, totally agree with you. I mean, and you know, like you're saying, like once, once they've decided to take that action, to have that info that can help them, you know? And I think that's, that's what you and I, people like us are, are trying to do. And I think, uh, I think it's worth the time that we put in, you know, it's, uh, it is a lot of time. It's a lot of time and effort. Right. And, and that's not like a, oh, poor me scenario. It's a, I've made this intentional choice that this is worth it. This is how I want to spend my time. Right. And that's the cool thing about FI is, you can spend your time and your resources however you deem fit. You just have to figure out, hey, what does that look like, right? And what does that look like for me now? But also knowing that you can you can constantly update your life. You can constantly make changes. You can figure out, hey, what's working for me now? And I think that is just super exciting to me. Yeah, agree 100%. Well, I want to say congrats to you and Jonathan, everything you're doing and will do. And I, my final question I ask all my guests on the show, there's people at various stages of their financial independence journeys, but particularly for those people who are kind of in those early stages, they're in the grind, they're still having a hard time seeing the end of that, uh, that arc, that journey they're going on. Do you have just a final piece of advice that might help them on that journey to financial independence? Yeah. I mean, I would say just, you know, stick with it and it's worth it. You get to design, like you don't have to be beholden to a job or some elusive they, right? Like there's nobody impacting your life other than you. And like, that is just a real wonderful position of power to be in. And just know you don't have to hit home runs. That's the coolest thing. Like I never hit a home run with anything. I never made more than six figures at my, at my job. And yet I reached by by the time I was like 35, 36 years old, 
it's as we say on our show, it's that that aggregation of marginal gains. It's these one percent changes that you can make. That when you start adding them all together, all these little one percent better scenarios, over and over again, over years and you know ten or fifteen years, your life is going to be dramatically transformed. And you don't have to hit home runs. You don't have to win the lottery. You don't have to start a tech company. You just have to take action today and tomorrow. And just keep moving forward. Love it. Well said. So, if, if people want to hang out with you, we've talked a lot about Choose FI. Do you have anything going on or any place you'd, you'd guide people? I'll put it in the show notes as well. But where should yeah. people hang out with you guys? No, I appreciate it, John. So, yeah, I mean, we obviously we have the podcast. So, just subscribe, Choose FI. Uh, we have a whole bunch of community areas, like you, we kind of alluded to. We have uh, Choose FI local groups in. 300 cities throughout the world with in real life meetups, local, you can meet local people who are on the path to FI and just go to chooseify.com slash local or chooseify.com slash start. And I've been actually involved in my own group, not lately, but we, we had, I think whenever the, uh, the fire documentary was coming out, our, our yeah. local FI, FI group hosted that. And it's been, it's been a great resource in the upstate of South Carolina. So that definitely nice. encourage, encourage people to do that. Nice. Brad, it was awesome catching up with you. Hope we get to do it one of these days in person again. <laughs> but uh, look forward to seeing you and uh, we'll t- talk some more soon. Cool. Sounds good. And thanks All again, Chuck. Right. All right, Brad. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that'll help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.